Be my pants and belly, be my pants and belly, be my pants and belly, my jeans are never empty. Be my pants and belly, be my pants and belly, be my pants and belly, your scheming don't affect me. I'm fresh, I'm fly, I'm so damn. More than 500 horses when I roll by. I'm calm, I'm cool, they think brand new. I don't handcuff, you can get the whole damn crew. Be my pants and belly, be my pants and belly. I bet she let me, she been feeling since she met me. Well, hello everybody. My name is Jason DaCosta. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to my show. That was a little Lloyd Banks featuring a G Unit, Beamer, Benz, or Bentley. And actually, it's got a cameo by Joel Santana. I know all that sounded like uh, ancient words to many of you out there, but they used to be a very popular uh, group of fellers that used to sing rap songs with 50 Cent. When I was a wee little lad, I used to listen to them. In fact, I still have a G-Unit hoodie um, that I find from time to time when I look at all of my clothes and give some of them away. I should probably give that away, but it's, you know, G-Unit, so I'll keep it for a little while longer. Um, anyways, thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about... Uh, the concepts of redemption and forgiveness um, and, and showing you some portions in the Old Testament where that concept was actually um, already sort of fulfilled once. Um, that being when the children of Israel came back from Babylonian captivity. Um, God uh, broke the yoke from around their neck, broke the bond, bondage and brought them back and brought the uh, many of the dispersed of Israel back with them as well. When they came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, that was a sort of uh, redemption and forgiveness. And, and it's very clear from the book of Jeremiah is where we're going to be today. But we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about uh, an email that I got from a gentleman a couple days ago. Um, he had reached out to me and uh, I guess he came across my website, which... For those of you who check out my website, obviously there's um, you know some modification and updating that needs to be done um, in accordance with my um, latest uh, developments and you know things of that nature. So uh, a lot of the material is very good, still very accurate. Uh, I wouldn't change much of it, but um, there are some things, of course, that need modification. And of course, in a busy life and busy hectic, uh, I'm a traveling salesman basically, so I travel quite a good bit and. Um, you know, coupled with trying to maintain um, a personal life as well as do these audios and uh, also, uh, you know, work in the home office when I'm home and everything else. It's just, you know, life gets kind of hectic. So haven't gotten around to that quite yet, but I hope to at some point in the future before the rapture of the saints. Um, but this gentleman uh, reached out to me and I just wanted to share his email. I thought it was kind of encouraging, although I would disagree in one place, I'm sure. Uh, you will recognize it when I read it, but it, overall it was a good email. I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, this is what he writes. He says, Jason, I was doing a Google search for James 3.7 and its beast of the field imagery depicting the Gentiles as with Peter in Acts 10, and your, bl your blog site popped up. Until then, I had never heard of you. LOL. Hold on one moment, please. Okay. So until then, I had never heard of you, lol. After reading your enlightening posts, I felt inclined to comment. I have had a solid relationship with Christ for close to 40 years. I believe that all things have been fulfilled. I understand the label now is hyper-preterist. Period. At Christ's AD 70 coming, when he destroyed the Mosaic economy to establish himself exclusively for all time. Period. Uh, across the years, I know of no one, including the myriad of Bible scholars, who even come close to seeing or even beginning to understand that Genesis 1 is entirely poetic imagery.
and then he says, oh, I lost my place, there it is. The entirety of Genesis 1 through Genesis 2, 3 is consistent with metaphorical, allegorical, symbolical language exclusively and was never meant to be taken literally. Scripture wasn't written in a vacuum. Israel, along with its ancient Near Eastern neighbors, thought and spoke in a liter literary language that was highly symbolic. In the case of Genesis 1, we find an opening prologue and perhaps somewhat polemical written poetically to set the stage for the rest of, of the Torah. And through to Revelation, the writer of Revelation borrows and weaves extensively from Genesis. The writer of Genesis 1 is depicting a real event in high symbolism. This is the beginning of national Israel. What follows is not the creation of humankind, but the formation of Israel through covenant. Amen to that. And he says, it isn't humankind that was ever formed in Yahweh's image, but the nation of Israel exclusively through covenant. The irony is, contrary to popular belief, it is Israel alone, and he capitalized alone, through covenant relationship with Yahweh that is formed in the image of God. The rest of us are the outsiders, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Not only are we not created in God's image, but we are the unclean masses. Now, comma, the death and resurrection of Christ has broken the partition to form both Jew and Gentile into one family. <clears throat> I won't go on, but I'd like to say also that your blog posting on Romans 1 is spot on, and the majority fail to see this. Romans 1 is an exclusive indictment of covenant Israel and its idolatry beginning at Sinai. Paul is here calling out national Israel for its unfaithfulness to their one God, Yahweh. Paul isn't even thinking, capitalized letters, of humanity in general in the opening of his letter to the Romans, but specifically Israel. <clears throat> and the majority fail to see this, but thankfully, for those who are open and searching, <clears throat> you have shined some light into the darkness of orthodoxy. I've gone too long with this email, but felt compelled to reach out to you. Peace and kindest regards. <clears throat> so... Uh, just a nice, uh, nice email. I know that obviously I would disagree with him about certain things when, you know, like he mentioned at the end there that, um, uh, you know, Christ has broken down the partition to form both Jew and Gentile into one family. And I would say that um, what Christ really nailed to the cross, as the Bible says, was the law. Uh, and he broke down the enmity that was over that law. Um, and that enmity was between the two houses. It was between the... Um, uh, house of Judah and the house of Israel. And just like in Isaiah chapter 11 says um, that the uh, once this they would be brought back from, um, once they would be redeemed and brought together, uh, they would, uh, Judah would no longer harass uh, Ephraim and Ephraim would no longer harass Judah and, you know, just stuff like that. It basically, the, uh, the, the bringing, so what we have to understand, like I've said before, is that the Jews actually looked at the Samaritans as Gentile. Um, they had looked at them as pagan because they had intermingled with uh, foreigners and they had become, um, you know, basically to them unclean. So they actually called and referred to these uh, these these um, Samaritans and the surrounding ones as, as Gentiles, uh, Gentiles in the flesh. But they were, um, you know, still obviously God's people. They were the of the northern kingdom and, and a lot of them um, were brought back. But. The point is, is that to me, the uh, the broken the wall that was broken down was between the the house of Judah and the house of Israel, who just happened to be Gentile, many of them uh, in the flesh, and uh, guilty, by the way, for that gent for that uncircumcision of the flesh. Um, but Christ came to break that down, and He died for sins committed under that first covenant, which. It didn't matter if you were in Judah, Israel, if you were in Rome, wherever you were, if you were um, part of that covenant structure, you were, um, you know, under that curse, which began at the beginning. Um, but everything else he says is just spot on. I just love how, uh, you know, he's, he's in tune to the covenant creation aspect where uh, it, the, the beginning of the Bible outlines Israel's creation and not, not all humanity. Um, Israel was created in God's image and not all humanity and, and so on and so forth. So... Uh, a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, just very uh, encouraged by that uh, that message. And I'm not going to mention the man's name, but uh, just had to tell him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
But anyways, when we're looking at uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, chapter 32, um, we're looking at the, the assurance of uh, God's people returning from Babylon to Jerusalem to reclaim their position as the people of God. Um, God uh, prophesied it through Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you know, gave the word and they were in Babylonian captivity, but God was reassuring them and assuring them that they would be brought back at some point in the future. And uh, if you listen to my uh, Hebrews 8 teaching a couple days back or last week, I don't even remember when I posted it now. Um, but the uh, Hebrews 8 teaching basically talked about um, how Hebrews 8 is totally misunderstood in that people uh, believe that the author of Hebrews was suggesting that the law would be written on the hearts in this soon to come new covenant that was approaching when the author of Hebrews wrote. Uh, when in fact, all that the author of Hebrews is doing there is he's quoting what Jeremiah did some 600 years prior, uh, when Jeremiah looked ahead to his days, uh, his coming days, and prophesied of that new covenant that was coming when God would bring the children out from Babylon back to Jerusalem to reclaim their position as the holy people, to rebuild the temple. God would rewrite and write his laws on their hearts and in their minds. They would be his people and he would be their God. None of them would have to tell each other about God for they would all know him from the least to the greatest and so on and so forth. So Hebrews 8 is basically just quoting that. And he says, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second. In other words, if the covenant prior to their Babylonian captivity had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for that second one. Um, but he did find fault with them and and that's what Jeremiah was saying in Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will create a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. So that was actually kind of all coming to um, coming to pass there. And that's exactly what Jeremiah was talking about. So, Je so Hebrews chapter 8 is basically just pulling from that, quoting that old time scenario that happened when God established a new covenant and wrote the laws on their, mind, on their hearts. Uh, and then he says, uh, he says in that at the very end of chapter eight, he says in that uh, uh, first covenant, he, he made obsolete in order to bring the new one in. And then he says, what is be now now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. In other words, that covenant that was made, that new covenant where the law was written on their hearts and on their minds was about to fade away. It was becoming obsolete. It was in the process of becoming obsolete. It was in the process of growing old and it was about to fade away. He's not applying that to a future. He's looking back on it and saying that that covenant where the law was written in the hearts was about to fade away. That's very important to notice. Many people, most people don't get that. But uh, just to kind of go back on Jeremiah 32, uh, in verse 26, we're going to read a little bit. It says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against this city shall come and set fire to it and burn it with the houses on who whose roofs, roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me in their youth, for the children of Israel have prov provoked me to only to anger with the works of their hands, says the Lord. For this city has been to me a provo uh, provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned to me the back and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them. Yet they have not listened to receive instruction, but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Moloch, which I did not command them, nor did I, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel concerning this city of which you say it shall be delivered into the hand of, uh, shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in my great wrath. <clears throat> I will bring them back to this place. 
I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing good from them, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do good and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Now notice he says there that uh, that they may fear him forever and that he would make an everlasting covenant with them. Now nobody would deny that this is about the return from Babylon. Um, it says it there, clear as day. The whole entire context of all these surrounding chapters is all about the return from Babylon when they came back to Jerusalem. This was 600 years before uh, AD 70. All right? Now look about... What he says, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them from doing good to them, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. So, so what does everlasting mean if it doesn't mean truly everlasting? Because clearly uh, in AD 70, just like Jesus predicted, God ended that system. He, he burned down, he demolished the temple, he destroyed the people, he totally put an end to that whole entire covenant, that whole entire law, all that, all that system that, that was involved, he put an end to it. But, but he says here that he would bring them back and he would establish them in an everlasting covenant. So clearly, you know, we need to understand everlasting in its proper context. It's just long. It just means a duration of time, a long time. It could mean 40 years, it could mean 100 years, it could mean 600 years. Um, but it really doesn't mean everlasting in the sense that you and I would think as an eternal, never-ending, ongoing, continuously with no end ever. Um, verse 42 says, For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will bring them, bring on them all the good that I have promised them, and their fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate, without man or beast, it has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Uh, men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Ju Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, and in the cities of the south, for I will cause their captives to return. All right. Um, and uh, give me one second. I just want to find another thing that I wanted to show you. Um, hmm. Well, well, we'll come back to that, that portion. But really what I wanted to show you is the redemption language. I'm not sure if it's here or if it's in the next chapter. Um, I kind of do this all off the top of my head. But point, point is there we can see that God was going to bring them back from Babylon. He was going to establish a new covenant with them, a, a perpetual everlasting covenant. He calls it elsewhere. Um, and we know that that covenant came to an end. So clearly it wasn't everlasting. Uh, the very next chapter in Jeremiah 33 talks about the restored nation again. In other words, when they brought, when they would be brought back. He says in verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. For thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, which have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mounds and the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men whom I will slay in my anger and my fury for all, those, for all whose wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. All for, those, all for whose wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. Behold, I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return. And I will rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations who shall hear all the good that I do to them. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for them. So again, we can see here that this bringing back from Babylon, this bringing back of the captives was what? What, what did uh, Jeremiah call it? He says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and I will forgive their transgressions against me. So that bringing back was all about Israel, nobody further. It was about God's, God's people. 
and that gathering into their land, into the promised land, they would call it Jerusalem, um, was considered salvation in a sense. It was considered redemption. It was considered uh, forgiveness of sin. It was con considered pardoning and forgiving them of their iniquity um, because he had brought them back. All right, we're, we're going to look at... Uh, Let's see. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 50 again, which is about this same time frame, the judgment on Babylon. It says, The word that the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah. It says, Declare among the nations, proclaim and set up a standard, proclaim, do not conceal it. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is shamed, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are humiliated, her images are broken. For out of the north a nation comes up against her, which shall make her land desolate, and no one shall dwell there. They shall move, they shall depart, both man and beast. All right, and then he says, In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. With continual weeping they shall come. That's that repentant heart. And seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion. That's Jerusalem. It says, With their faces toward it, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. There's that perpetual covenant again that, that we saw a little while ago, that eternal everlasting covenant that we know was ended in AD 70. Um, so we need to understand these things in their proper light. Uh, verse 6 says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All who found them have devoured them. And their adversaries said, We have not offended. Because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, the Lord, the hope of their fathers. All right, and then as we uh, go down, this is all basically just an indictment against Babylon. Um, it says, Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria devoured him. Now at last this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. He says, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria, but I will bring back Israel to his home, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead in those days. And at that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found, for I will pardon those whom I preserve. All right, so again, this is what I wanted to talk about was that redemption, that the uh, buying them back, if you will, bringing them back, forgiving their sins, pardoning their sins, starting a new covenant with them. Um, this was what was happening when God would bring Israel back from uh, captivity and from the nations. This was the first time he did it. All right. And so we can see how this is all kind of tying together. Um, with Hebrews 8 when it talks about, you know, he, he looks back at that, that point in history when um, Jerusalem uh, was rebuilt and the, the people of Israel came back and God forgave their, forgave their sins and wrote the law in their hearts. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, this is actually the same context as Isaiah 65 and 66. Isaiah 65 and 66 is also simply just about the return from Babylon to establish the new heaven, the new earth, the new temple. Uh, it was a new covenant that was being made. And we know this is the case because in uh, verse uh, in chapter 66, we read about the Levites and uh, the priests that would be established there during this new heaven and new earth. We read about the new moon days and the Sabbath days and um, all that, all those you know feasts and everything that would take place during that new heaven and new earth that was coming that Isaiah was predicting. And in uh, Isaiah 65, we read about God's elect long enjoying the work of their hands elect is is exclusive to israel it doesn't extend beyond them um so all of that tells me clearly that isaiah 65 and 66 is clearly 150 percent pertaining to the return from babylon um, when god established a new covenant with the house of israel and the house of judah um, and it is not as most full preterist teachers teach today um, some AD 70 new heaven new earth um, at all, actually, it's it's quite uh, far from that. Um, but the, the the main question that I want you to leave with today and think about uh, is considering that all this redemption, all this forgiveness of sin, all this pardoning pardoning of iniquity language in the Old Testament um, only pertained to Israel. That's it. It didn't pertain to anyone else. These these bringing this bringing back to the promised land of Jerusalem. This 
um, inheritance of this, this land, this new heaven, new earth, um, this forgiveness of sins, this redemption of transgression, this pardoning of iniquity, um, all pertained to Israel coming back from the nations where they were scattered. All right. So what I want to ask you is why would that change in the New Testament? Why would suddenly in the last days, in Israel's last days, why would, um, before God brought them into their heavenly country, why would that concept apply to anyone beyond Israel? It doesn't make any sense. Redemption, meaning bought back, bought, uh, brought back, bought back, whatever you want to say. Um, redemption, forgiveness of sins, pardoning of transgressions, uh, pardoning of iniquity. This was all relative to Israel because, again, they were under the law. They were the ones violating the law. Paul says, without the law, there is no transgression. So in order to transgress, you need God's law, God's holy standard to do that. And that's what only Israel had. God had not done that with any other nation. It was only Israel's law. And like Paul said, as many as were under that law were under the curse. So think about that and consider it today while you're um, in your office acting like you're doing work when the boss walks by. Um, think about the fact that no other nation had the law. No other nation in the Old Testament was ever pictured as being redeemed, uh, redeemed forgiven, pardoned besides Israel because all those nations were sort of outside of the covenant, outside of the law. And then we get to the New Testament and we have all the same exact language, redemption, forgiveness of sins, you know, everything. And of course, all of it's pulled from the Old Testament. I mean, who would deny that? Basically, everything we see in those last days in that gospel age when the gospel was urgently and imminently going out into the nations for the sole purpose of regathering the elect because the time was short, said Paul. Um, why is that any different than everything we see in the Old Testament, especially since it's just pulling from Israel's history? Um, to me, that's another telltale sign um, that uh, this is, was all about the, the uh, redemption and regathering of Israel and, and nobody further. Um, and it ended when that all, when all Israel was saved, which, by the way, had to happen before the end, because like Paul says in Romans 11, um, it wouldn't be a second before the fullness of the Gentiles came in that all Israel would be saved. And at that point, that's when the new covenant would be established and Jacob's sins would be forgiven. So unless all Israel isn't, if all Israel is not saved, and if the fullness of those Gentiles that Paul speaks of, it has not come in yet, then you don't have a new covenant and you don't, and Jacob's sins have not been forgiven. So basically nothing that Christ did is valid yet, if that's the case. And you're taking a step right back into the confusing waters of futurism, if that's your, if that's your view. And I know many people are going to do that because they would rather, you know, go back to futurism, um, you know, and, and, and do it that way than have to man up and actually deal with what the text actually says. Um, but anyways, that's pretty much all for today, folks. I uh, appreciate you uh, giving this a listen. I uh, thank you for your time, and I hope that you all have a very lovely day, and we will be back to talk to you very soon. Take care, everybody. She let me, she been feeling since she met me